So, good morning, everybody. I'm very delighted to see you here in this session, and I'm very looking forward to the session on global education in Africa. My name is Annette Scheunflug. I'm a professor for foundations in education at the University of Bamberg in Germany, and I'm very delighted to be together in this session with Professor Olivia Advoa Tiva Frimpong Kwapo from the University of Ghana and Professor Jose Franz from the University of Western Cape. Welcome both to this session. Jose, I'm very much looking forward and kindly ask you to, uh, to start and I give you the floor. Once again, good morning. My name is Jose Franz and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation at the University of the Western Cape. Um, it gives me great pleasure this morning to share um, this study with you that we did here in um, Sub-Saharan Africa on global citizenship education. I want to upfront say that this study is um, part of a bigger study and I'm only reporting this morning on one aspect of the study. Um, we were able to do this in conjunction with UNESCO South Africa, as well as with um, JET, which focuses on global citizenship education. So when we talk about global citizenship, according to Israel 2012, um, it says that it is the idea that one's identity transcends political borders, geographical borders, and that the responsibilities or rights are derived from membership in a broader class called humanity. And so it is not where you are finding yourself right now, but actually how do you communicate across the globe? That is what global citizenship is all about. When we come to global, global citizenship education, it becomes the responsibility of the educator to ensure that the, the learners develop a comprehensive understanding of not only their local challenges, but also the global challenges. And so for us, the, the education community is paying attention to how do we get our learners or our students in our case in the higher education sector to understand social, political, cultural and global issues. Not only how it affects them in where they are based, but how does it affect the, in, the interaction with the rest of the world? And I think that for us has become important there's a statement here that says, you know, Mera, um, in 2015 said that global citizenship education should be people-centered development. And I hope that I'm going to bring that through this morning as I speak. I come from a higher education institution. And so the focus is what is the role of universities? The question we wanted to, uh, to, to look at in, and understand is how does the university um, contribute to building um, civil society? How do they contribute to, to developing cultural values in the students or the graduates that they produce? And how do they ensure that what students are doing, do they take into the communities and the societies in which they live once they um, start working, once they leave university? So we were very conscious of the fact when we did this project that when we looked at literature, there was a very, um, the voices from the South were silent and that there was lots coming from the North in terms of telling us what global citizenship is all about. And then if you look at the map on your, on your right hand side here, it shows how Sub-Saharan Africa forms a major part of the African continent. And yet when we find ourselves talking about um, global citizenship education, this whole um, portion of the country is silent. Now, there was a, a report in 2015 by Von Kotze and Macmillan from UCT, University of Cape Town, right here in South Africa, in the Western Cape, which did a study. And they found that global, global citizen students have one small advantage. They have learned to work together with others. They have learned to listen with different voices. And that is the part that, I, that we want to link to the fact that we're talking about when we talk about global citizenship education, it's about a person-centered approach that we're wanting to construct here when we move forward. So when we looked at the study that we were going to do, and I'm, as I said, I'm only reporting on one aspect, um, our task was to show a greater sense of Southern agency. What is coming from the South in terms of 
globalization and global citizenship education um, and in, in comparison to what the North is saying. And so our study aimed to review the literature to determine the strategies used to promote global citizenship among students and staff in higher education institutions in Africa. So we explored how the higher education sector in Africa pursues quality education that is inclusive of global citizenship education. So our research question was, how does the higher education environment facilitate global citizenship in staff and in students? We conducted this through a methodology called a rapid review. Now a rapid review is not the same as a systematic review. A systematic review is very focused and more intense, whereas a rapid review is, is conducted in a small space of time. And um, we also looked at it um, in terms of, this was during the COVID period, and that is why we decided on a rapid review so that we, we had a short space to um, get the information that we needed. And so we did a comprehensive search of various databases using words like global citizenship, universities, higher education institutions, strategies, and specifically Africa. And this was conducted last year during May 2020 and June um, 2020. And we limited our search for a five year period because this in literature, it was saying that this is where um, global citizenship education was emerging in the African context. Our results, um, that's very small, but our results showed um, we had 1,102 records that identified um, terms that were similar to what we were looking for. But after all the exclusions of the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we only ended up with eight citations relevant to the African continent. Most of them were in South Africa, and then there was one in Ghana, one in Zimbabwe, and one in Nigeria. And we found that the target population in the studies was a range from undergraduate students to doctoral students to academic staff. So it covered um, quite a range of the higher education sector. So when I look at the results, and as I'm going to report onto the res results, there's three clear categories that emerge. The one is that there are institution-based strategies to drive global citizenship education in Africa. The second is student-focused strategies to drive global citizenship education in Africa. And the third is that we rely mostly on theory to talk about what global citizenship education is, but really do we implement it in terms of strategies. So the results are presented here to promote global citizenship. Um, in terms of institutional focus strategies, we found that universities employed credit bearing programs where students needed to register for the program and they engaged in um, global citizenship and they came out with a certificate or something that indicated that they had engaged in this process. Um, internationalization, internationalizing the curriculum for all students was also something that was um, key to what um, universities were doing, and that was especially in South Africa, allowing students the opportunity to do internationalization. And then in Zimbabwe, the internationalization for higher education became something that was spoken about in more than one institution, and that the, it became a topic of discussion. Um, and so it was at institutional level that this was um, implemented rather than just specific activities. In the student-focused strategies, however, it was small studies that was conducted among students and how they could use various vehicles to promote global citizenship. For example, virtual learning. How do we get to speak to one another, even though we might not be able to travel like COVID? Social networks and, and, and internationalization at home with those international students registered at the institution. How do they get to speak with each other? And also, um, reporting on the experience of international students um, when they come to institutions like uh, in South Africa. And then we, there was a, a paper from Ghana which focused on how do we incorporate students as partners um, theoretically to be able to drive your internationalization or global citizenship agenda in terms of what you're wanting to do. 
So when coming to the discussion, um, we wanted to see what is the what is the South saying around this whole concept of global citizenship education? And there were five points that came out um, of the literature that we reviewed. The one dealt with international travel, then language proficiency, engagement and service learning, curriculum content, and introduction of social networks and virtual learning. And I will just quickly unpack each one of those. So in the international travel that became very important in this in the strategies that were utilized by institutions they felt that um, students needed to travel abroad abroad to be able to get um, this global citizenship experience however we, the, there was also a report that um, it was found that students who could not afford to do this were they not um, afforded the opportunity for this global citizenship education experience and this again raised the concept of the inequalities in terms of um, those that have and able to travel will be able to get the experience versus those who have not. And so during this COVID period, we have, in, especially in the South African context, have had to rethink um, global citizenship education and the travel component because we were not allowed to travel. Does that mean that global citizenship has to stop? How do we then? start to incorporate that into our curriculum so that we can uh, give, give students this exposure. The second part was about language proficiency that came out. Um, and the review suggested that the focus on foreign language study tended to frame global citizenship in such a way that enables students to participate in the global market, meaning that students needed to take up a different language to be able to participate and engage um, in, 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 in this um, experience of global citizenship education. Was that fair? Did it provide quality? Was it people-centered? Were the questions that we continue to ask ourselves as we looked through the literature. The third aspect that we found that was covered was that engagement in service learning was key to driving the conversation around global citizenship education and broadening the views of um, the students that participated in these activities in order to understand not only their lived reality, but the reality broader than their own. Finally, curriculum con content was another aspect that we found that was very key and that the key areas that emerged during these curriculum or curricula that were focusing on global citizenship education, the focus in there was a lot on self-reflection, social responsibility, employability, leadership, problem solving, and entrepreneurship outcomes. So these were the areas that were focused that were um, linked to the um, curriculum based uh, strategies that were implemented in um, these various institutions in Africa. Finally, there was this introduction of social networks and virtual learning. It showed that there was low engagement with virtual learning um, students did not really actively engage during this period. This might change. This was in 2017. And we might find that now with co the onset of COVID and the rapid move to virtual learning, this might become a space where we can engage more in terms of global citizenship education and, and, and not what that 2017 study showed. Um, we found that during COVID, um, social networks and um, online spaces like we are currently engaging in became more prominent and perhaps these will become the spaces where we can promote global citizenship to be able to talk to each other more and engage with each other on various topics. So in conclusion from our um, rapid review that we did, we found that there was no consensus on the meaning and understanding of global citizenship in the higher education sector in Africa. In the current review, the concepts that emerged as part of global citizenship for African higher education institutions focused on social justice and equity, culture and values, and understanding and making a difference. I think this clearly links to what I said at the beginning in terms of how do we make global citizenship education more people-centered. So global citizenship can thus be understood in various ways depending on the objective of the institutions. And so we also realize that in some instances, 
it was embedded in what they were doing. And in some, it was very in, in explicit in terms of this is what we're wanting to achieve with global citizenship education in our institution. We found that no, numerous factors influence the higher education sector, which includes government policies, um, social change, etc. And so when we want to talk about global citizenship education, we need to ensure that we have strategies that nurture um, our students as well as our staff to understand um, this broader concept. An important factor that should be considered is how global citizenship can actually be internalized by people and implemented at institutional level in higher education institutions in Africa through contextual and local relevance. And we found that this needs further study so that we can understand when we want to share the voice from the South, that we understand our local relevance and how does it impact on the global setting. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge co-authors who worked with me on this paper, as well as the UNESCO project and JET. Thank you for listening. Thank you very, very much, Jose, for this insight and for this very reflected analysis of the discourse in the Sub-Saharan Africa hemisphere. So it was a very interesting insight and a very, very rich, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, the next speaker is Professor Olivia Adwati Vashpripong Gwapong from the University of Ghana. And I hope that you joined us and that you hear us. And I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Annette. So I am here to share with you um, the case of um, School of Continuing and Distance Education at University of Ghana how we have been promoting a global citizenship education under the disguise of adult education. And now we're moving towards development education. Um, I am in a school that has a history, a history that started as a department of extra moral studies when um, the Oxford delegacy before the, uh, in our colonial times decided to establish a university college in Ghana and decided to come and give open lectures here and there to build the capacity of people and to expose them to what is happening around the globe. Then they start that with this department of extra moral studies to expose people to what happens uh, around the globe and also within the university that they were setting up. As we gain independence, that then our president Kwame Nkrumah then decided to change the name into public education to orient the entire people in Ghana and around the globe about what is happening, issues of development and how they can all be part of development to have a, a, a sense of citizenship among ourselves. After he was overthrown, then we realized that B, then the university has been established, University of Ghana has been well established. And they realized that then we had to really promote a university-based adult education. So then we decided to rebrand ourselves to offer programs in diploma in adult education, masters in adult education, PhD in adult education, and then later bachelors in adult education. And they're still promoting that community engagement, global citizenship education among the Ghanaian populace with global partners to promote that, to build that kind of orientation. After a period of time, our students were thinking that, especially when we introduced the bachelor's program, our students were thinking that when you're doing adult education, then you are just going to do literacy education. So then we realized there's the need to rebrand ourselves. So then we adopted the name Adult Education and Human Resource Studies. It still didn't work for our students. And we are at a stage where we are looking at development education within the scope of global citizenship education. And therefore, now we are operating as a school of continuing and distance education. And what is the vision of this school of continuing and distance education? Um, we seek to promote world-class university-based adult education 
then we're still operating under the name of adult education that will meet national development needs through quality research, teaching and learning and community engagement. Within the school, we have three departments. We have the Department of Adult Education and Human Resource Studies I've talked about. We have Department of Distance Education, and then we have the University of Ghana Learning Centers. All these are supposed to be units, units that will promote our broad scope of global citizenship education among the people in Ghana, and they're also selling the country and the work of the university to a people around the globe. And therefore, what are strategic goals of this school? We seek to expand and strengthen our resources. We also seek to promote the discipline and build professional bodies and join with other external professional bodies. We also seek to increase enrollment to our distance education program that will enhance access to people all over the world. We seek to promote academic excellence, research, and then work with qualified quality, and then also cutting edge research and publications. Now, I am just going to pick a, a few things from the three units of the school. The Department of Adult Education and Human Resource Studies, which we are currently rebranding as a Department of Development Education. What have we been doing? We have been interested in reorienting our faculty to recent publications that will, tell, that will lead to development education and global citizenship education. We also engage people, we want, we want to get outlets. So we are working on having a departmental journal it's been being, I mean, it's been there, but it's not been active. We are working on that. We also work to uh, publish edited books. Currently, we are working with an edited book with uh, Springer, and it's on development education. Because we want to share how development education is operating in Ghana. And therefore, that project is ongoing. We are at the stage of putting the final pieces together to submit to Springer for them to process for publication. We have just come out with a special edition of a journal. It was a project with the university to be able to have a special edition that will share our perspective of how we are operating with global citizenship education as the focus. And then also we are collaborating for research and we are setting up, in fact, it's registered kind of, is an advanced state, a society for adults and development education in Africa. So that with that we can bring together all the think tanks in development education, global citizenship education, and be able to share our thoughts and have projects and do all kinds of things that academics are expected to do. We are promoting our PhD program, and we have a success story of graduating 10 PhD students in a year. And for us, it is good so that as we enhance these activities, we would have both um, faculty and students promoting global citizenship education uh, around um, in our society. And we have faculty who we are trying to promote to senior lecturer and other levels so that, I mean, we would build ourselves up very well. Now, because based on the background that I gave and students are not comfortable with the adult education that we're promoting, and therefore we are moving towards development education and then human resource development so that through that, we will build them for global citizenship we have worked hard to review our programs as the department, and therefore we have a PhD rebranded as Development Education and Human Resource Studies. We have our Master's in Development Education. We have another in Human Resource Development. We have Bachelor's in Development Education, Youth Development, and others. We are rebranding, we are moving from adult education to development education discipline and then another discipline, human resource development, so that one, our students, our clientele would be able to connect well with us. We can also attract the young people into our department and be able to build a future that will prepare people to be exposed, to be learned in the citizenship that we all seek for them to have. 
Now, another wing that we have as a school is the University of Ghana Learning Centers, which we are operating and we are responsible for. They are promoting our extension programs. And one branch that we have is what we call annual New Year School, where we bring together people from all over the world and then to share with them issues of national and international interest. And at the end of this, we come up with a communique to inform policy. And that is one critical thing that as a school, we um, want, we, we allow the learning centers that are represented in the country, in the country to promote that. And then we also want them to be a research hub and so many other activities that we seek them to do while they also promote their faculty in academia. We have a department of distance education, and that is also an extension, it's a wing that gives access to academic programs of the entire University of Ghana to people in Ghana and also those around the globe. This, you may call it online learning, and COVID-19 really has helped us. It has helped us in the sense that, yes, we said we were doing distance learning, but the paper-based aspect was too strong, and therefore it was limiting our vision to widen access to people around the globe. And therefore, come COVID, we were forced to go online, as you all experienced, and therefore we prepared our tutors, we set up online system, we provide support services, and now we are conducting some of our uh, you know, teaching and learning online, continuous assessment online. This is examination that is still a little bit of face-to-face, -face, depending on the examiner. But the university policy allows for online examinations to be taken. With this, we are happy that we'll be able to sell our programs and make it accessible to people across the globe and build our capacity for global citizenship. And then also, what do we intend to expect from the department? We hope to improve its administrative systems. We want to accelerate the technology-mediated learning. And also, people are interested in our postgraduate programs and want to promote that. Now that we are go we've gone virtual and can be accessible all over the world. The black dots until COVID-19 were just the learning centers that we were providing the distance learning. But now we are online and we are going beyond the black dots that we see on the screen. And what do we see? We anticipate that with the influence of technology and how we have harnessed the potential that um, COVID-19 has offered us. We'll be able to have a hybrid where we would have a combination of flipped virtual online and traditional learning so that our academic programs will be highly accessible. There wouldn't be much barrier, but people all over the world will be able to access us and build that collective citizenship that we all anticipate. We also have a non-traditional access. We don't just say you must pass an SAT or our high school diploma or this and that, but another way to widen access is the admission of non-traditional students through a, an access course to be able to act, admit them into our online programs. This also widens access for us. What is our direction for our global development education as of now? We hope to promote faculty development through grantsmanship, research and publications in the area of development education. We want to seek with now that we're going virtual, we want to internationalize access to a University of Ghana education through online learning in a large scale. And for me, as a Dean of School of Continuing and Distance Education, my vision is to mainstream distance learning, online learning, e-learning in across board in all disciplines at University of Ghana. Then we provide a technical backstopping so that as a, as a unit that's supposed to widen access to our programs and provide extra moral studies will then be making our content accessible to people around the globe, no matter the level and the status of that individual. As we you leveraging on technology, what are the issues? We have issues with data, 
internet connectivity, devices, and then training for faculty and students so that our online learning will be effective. I mean, these are issues that can be handled. Once we've identified them, we know that we will work towards addressing all these so that our, our, our desire and our vision to widen access and build the capacity of people around the globe to enhance our citizenship will be achieved. And therefore, but I feel that it's all a collaborative effort and we need all of us and people on this platform and colleagues all over the world to help us to enhance and make our indigenous content highly accessible so that as we learn from others, others also get the opportunity to learn from us. And therefore we need your collaborative effort in this. Thank you, Annette, for sharing and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia, for this very interesting insights in the development of your faculty and your, your department. And thank you very much for sharing this, um, this, how can I say, player for learning from each other, which I think is very, very important. Thank, thank you. you very much to both of you, to this inspiring lectures and this inspiring insights. And I think this has now opened a lot of ideas and reflections for further dialogue and for a shared understand, for, to share the understanding of global citizenship education and global learning. So thank you very much for these insights. And by this, I thank all the people who had been attending the session and people for uh, assisting from the technical side. And of course, the two speakers, because this was the most important for that.